Today's guest is Kelly Ryerson, better known as the Glyphosate Girl. I started following her probably at least a year ago, and I felt like her insight was so informative for me learning about glyphosates and our agriculture and exactly how things are processed. In this conversation, we go into exactly that and also the best options for you. You know, what what should you do if you're not ready to make a full commitment to an entirely organic diet, which let's face it, who is ready to make the commitment to a 100% organic diet. Even I try, but I'm not there. So I'm with you. If you're only 10% of the way there, we have some really helpful tips and things that we covered in this podcast to help you better navigate and understand because we're all busy and we don't all get the time to uh, dive into nutrition degrees, food label reading degrees. I mean, let's go on and on about all the things that we should probably try to do in this unfortunate situation that we find ourselves in in America where our food system isn't as transparent as we would like for it to be. I would like to take the chance to read Kelly's bio to you so that you know exactly who she is and why I thought she would be an amazing guest. So Kelly works at the intersection of health and agriculture, addressing the ways in which our food system, soil, and microbiome have been corrupted by the rampant use of toxic herbicides. She collaborates with scientists, farmers, policymakers, and companies to tackle pressing agricultural issues and their contribution to human disease. Kelly founded the educational platform Glyphosate Facts, which explains the public health emergency driven by overuse of the toxic pesticide Roundup. Kelly has a BA from Dartmouth College and an economics and N NBA, MBA, if I could say that right, with a certificate in healthcare public policy from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. She also studied integrative health coaching through Duke University. So she is not only very qualified, but she's very passionate. And I think you guys really enjoy our deep dive and our personal stories on the journey to health, wellness, and the best version of ourselves. I want you to know that there are many more decisions to be made and how to make it as simple for you as I can to live a healthy lifestyle. All right, Kelly, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. I admire you for your voice in this area of glyphosates and pesticides and what is going wrong with our agriculture, because I think that people deserve to know. And I think that not enough people know, because I tell you, when I go to a family barbecue and I'm struggling because I see glyphosates being fed to our children and to pregnant women around me, well-meaning people who love their children and love their significant others, and they have no idea. They don't know what's going on. And so you are such a powerful voice in this. And you, I've learned so much from you without even having really spoken to you. I've been following you for quite some time on Instagram. And you are such a wealth of knowledge on the topic of glyphosate. So let's start there with the obvious. What is a glyphosate? What are we talking about here? And um, sort of what is going on in the realm of pesticides and our food? Oh yeah. So first of all, it's so great to to talk to you and and meet you. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to share, as I always am, about this chemical that, as you say, like just a lot of people don't even know about. Very smart people don't know about, and just all these problems that can come from exposure to it, and to pesticides in general. And it is interesting because it really hasn't hit mainstream media yet because so much of media is really controlled by the powerful lobbyists and the powerful corporations that are behind making sure that these chemicals continue to be sprayed on our agricultural system. So that is mostly why people that we know and we love that are very well-meaning people do not know about this. And so thank goodness, first of all, for Instagram, because it does give you an opportunity to spread the information, although I've had some times in the past when that information has been quieted even on those, those um, sites. But nonetheless, um, so a little bit of a history of glyphosate. So it is a chemical 
that was originally discovered by some chemists and they were trying to find find a pharmaceutical use for it in the 1950s, 1960s. And they weren't able to do so, but they did notice that it has a great ability to, to bind to minerals. And so if they would use it to clean metal pipes and metal boilers by putting the glyphosate in the metal pipe, it would collect all of the mineral residue and then you could flush it out. So it was really powerful in doing that. And then in the 1970s, Monsanto, which is probably the most notorious company of the devil of all time, the chemical manufacturer, um, they realized that it has a great herbicidal property, meaning that it can kill plants. And so they felt that in comparison to other pesticides that had been out there, this was a relatively low toxic approach to killing weeds that people didn't want. So they packaged it up and in 1974, they launched the Roundup product. And Roundup is something that you see in Home Depot and unfortunately still Target and all around for use in landscapes and home gardening, but it's also sprayed on schools and parks. And it is also widely sprayed across all of our agricultural lands, except for organic uh, farms. So it's really everywhere. And they, so they launched this product. It was pretty successful at the get-go, um, but it really took off in its use once GMOs were launched. So GMOs, genetically modified organisms, were also developed by the company Monsanto. And they were developed to be resistant to the effects of glyphosate. That was the big thing. So farmers could plant these corn and soy and beets and these crops would grow. And Wait, when- so they otherwise would have not been able to grow under this glyphosate? Like the glyphosates would have killed them had they not been genetically modified to be able to survive? Would- exactly. Okay. That's exactly oh, Wonderful. <laughs> and so, so it was so great because now they're able to sell these seeds that they've patented as their own. So they've patented this life form really, which is a seed. They patented those and then they're able to sell tons and tons of Roundup because the farmers are like, this is great. I'm just planting this and I'm going to spray over the crop and the crop won't die, but all the weeds underneath will die. So then you look at use of glyphosate and it totally explodes in the mid 1990s, like right after 1996, when this is launched, then things get worse. In around 2004, they realized that if you spray a wheat field or a grain field or a legume, like a chickpea field, a bunch of different crops with glyphosate right before harvest, then it will kill out the entire crop evenly and make harvesting really easy. So you just go out with your combine and your tractor and you do one harvest at one time. And what's what made that amazing is that otherwise a farmer would have to sit and wait for different parts of the field to ripen, because usually, you know, one side might do do so more quickly than the other, but this way it was just one harvest. So unfortunately, with that practice, that means that a lot of our fruit is food is freshly sprayed with glyphosate, because you spray it, you harvest it, you send it to the mill, and it ends up in our bread, in our hummus, and just in a lot of food products. So now we are all highly exposed to this chemical. So do they wash? Is there any practice of washing this before? Like chickpeas, I'm thinking of hummus. Do they rinse them off even? Do you know? So no, because it's a systemic herbicide, meaning it's not it's not something that you just cover. It's not a contact herbicide where it's it penetrates the outside. It actually goes in through the roots and into the system, uh, in the cellular system of the plants itself. So you can't wash it off. It's called a systemic herbicide, um, unfortunately. So there's really no way to get it out of the plant aside from not using it in the first place. I heard of a study. I think it was Gary Brecka on Instagram that I saw him talking about a study of strawberries. And um, I'm going to paraphrase what he said here, but basically they took the strawberries and they juiced the strawberries and they tested the juice and there was enough levels of pesticides inside the juice to effectively respray a crop. Oh, I totally, I totally believe that. And that's pesticides overall there. You see in some of those types of the fruits, the fruit spraying, it's oftentimes less the glyphosate that's the issue. And it's more the fungicides and insecticides that are sprayed on it. 
um, because the fruit is more likely to be impacted by the fungal diseases. So yes, yeah, strawberries are, I mean, I think the berries are just the worst and it, it's really frustrating, but you won't see that pre-harvest spraying with strawberries, at least on glyphosate, but there's certainly plenty of other very toxic pesticides that are used. Yeah. So we're talking primarily about glyphosate, but why did you pick glyphosate? Because you mentioned that it's not the only um, issue. There are plenty of other toxic things being sprayed on our crops, but do you have a backstory with glyphosate specifically, or why is that the one? Why are you the glyphosate girl as opposed to the toxic spray on our food girl? (laughs) Yeah. It's so funny. There is a backstory to it. And I never intended, actually, I'm just focusing on this. But the reason why I did is because like many people, I found myself with a lot of chronic conditions that were unexplained by Western medicine, basically. And I was on tons of different drugs trying to treat like fatigue and rashes and hair loss and insomnia and just so many different physical bloating, symptoms. bloating, digestive problems, neuropathy. I mean, just the list was so did long. You, were that- you, did you swell? Were you swelling at all too? Like, did you have um, fluid retention in areas like uh- your- ankles or wrists. I mean, you're fairly tiny. That wasn't, you know, I had so many problems at the time. I probably didn't even focus on <laughs> I, <laughs> I see a so, lot of people having like lymphatic, you know, issues of, of, of holding a lot of water retention. And I honestly don't believe that as many Americans are as quote unquote overweight or, um, I, you know, to use the the term loosely, but, you know, people say, oh, you know, have the extra body fat. I think a lot of that is actually inflammation. I don't think people have quite as much body fat on them as they think that they do. I think a lot of it is swelling from cellular congestion, from toxins and things that basically don't allow our cells to basically breathe or transfer things in and out. So the toxins get stuck in the cell. When you overload, you don't really have a a way to... um, deal with that much, right? So we can, our bodies are great at detoxing. Sauna is a great way to detox. You know, our bodies are pretty good at it, but when it's every day, it's all the time. And I I know you've mentioned before, because I follow you on Instagram about how there's no entire escape from glyphosates, at least here in America and potentially worldwide, because this goes up into the air, it goes into the water. And so at some level, no matter what, you're going to have at least a little bit of an exposure. But I think the goal here is to understand how we can minimize that and what we can do to promote the things that we want more of and less of the things that we want, you know, we don't, we don't want to have um, so prominent. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and also just back to your question with the why glyphosate? So glyphosate is the most sprayed pesticide on this planet of all time. And so that makes it just so, it's so prominent in our lives. And any one of us could send a test in of our urine and our hair, and we would find it there. And in fact, I sent my daughter's baby tooth off to the lab oh. and they found glyphosate in that, and that formed when she Where? was Where? Where? How do you test for this? So I, there's a lab called HRI Labs. And it's in Iowa, and it's a fantastic um, guy who runs that lab named Dr. John Fagan. And a lot of times he will test foods. He tests urine regularly for people. He tests hair. You just Um, send in a sample. You just send in a sample. You can go to their website. I think it's hrilabs.com. And um, and you can order a test, a glyphosate test on the sample. Okay. And I actually also sent in semen samples a few years ago, and all of them came back positive for glyphosate. And this is something I'm really starting to work on right now because it's been shown in research that it kills sperm. It crosses the blood testes barrier when people consume it, and it kills sperm. And each time I see another article about crashing fertility, I'm like, oh my gosh, like who doesn't have glyphosate every day? Because as you just said, it's in the rain, it's in the air, it's in the water, it's everywhere. I mean, and so we all have it. Is it just me or doesn't it seem like there's way more fertility issues today? And I'm like, okay, am I just more aware of it or is it more, is it happening more and more? Because it sure seems like it's happening more and more. You know, I was getting my hair done the other day and she's, I've been through IVF two times and it's $30,000 each time. And I was just over with, with at a family barbecue and I was talking to somebody who didn't ha- get to have a second child because of the sperm of her partner who was just too weak and not well enough to, 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 to work naturally. So they went through IVF again, two times, $25,000 each time, and they weren't successful. And I just feel like these stories are coming up more and more. And it's, 
it's not fair and it's heartbreaking. And I think that people deserve to know what they can do and potentially eliminate to give themselves the better options. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm in a batting cage when it comes to my children. I have a a six and a four year old now, and I just feel like the balls are coming from me at every single direction. And I'm just, you know, swiping as, you know, vehemently as I can to try to keep my children away from these things. And that's again, you know, I've said it, but I do appreciate your voice in this. So um, before I get too sidetracked, please continue with your story about glyphosates and how you came to really understand um, through your own journey just how bad um, these can have an effect on us. Sure. And so I, when I was really sick, I didn't have a doctor that believed that I was really feeling these problems. So I saw like 20 plus doctors, specialists, and, and finally they're like, you are a psych case. I was put on two antidepressants, like any anxiety finally saw a psychiatrist who happened to have intake blood work that tested me for the first time on vitamins. And I was totally deficient, like completely deficient of vitamins, third world starving person. And then I saw a new doctor who suggested I try going gluten-free because she's noticed a lot of her female patients about my age were having success with that. And so I did that. Can I ask you real quick, were you taking vitamins at the time? Like, were you eating a healthy, like a, a normal, what would be considered by most people a healthy diet? I mean, what I did your diet look normal, like? Normal, healthy diet. Yeah, I was eating a normal, healthy diet with no supplements because it's just not something that I was even thinking about. Okay, like, so it's amazing you- now <laughs> because I, I just can't imagine not thinking very, very critically about the core vitamins that your body needs to work on. But at the time, I was like anyone else, just not thinking about it. Yeah, just so, busy. You're like, hey, I eat healthy. I eat well. I'm probably fine. Yeah. So, I mean, do you eat meat? Do you eat fish? Do you eat vegetables? You kind of eat. Were you were eating everything at the time? everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So normal, healthy diet, but not supplementing. So theoretically you should have probably been able to get enough to where you weren't a third world starving vitamin (laughs) deficient person. Okay. You really should. And it's so crazy because when I first got that result back from the psychiatrist, um, the psychiatrist was like, oh, that's not great, but he didn't really say much more. I don't know why he even bothered testing for it. And then my primary care doctor is like, well, none of that really even matters. That's that oh can't. Oh my gosh. You. Well, you know, I've talked to my <laughs> sports doctor who is an anesthesiologist, and he, he's like, Misha, we have to take like one course in nutrition. It's like really time, like it's, th- and that blows my mind that modern medicine doesn't understand nutrition because that is how we build who we are. That is the building blocks and foundation for how your body operates and how well you operate. Why do you think professional athletes, I can speak from my own experience, we have to focus so much on nutrition. On our Now, protein is like a, an obvious one, but I'm talking about our iron levels, our uh, vitamin D levels. I mean, any professional athlete, if you really um, want to be great at your craft, need to understand are these things balanced and well in order to be optimal. But I don't think optimal is reserved for athletes. Everybody in life should have a feeling of waking up in the morning and feeling good. Like you don't need a cup of coffee. Maybe you want one if you like it, sure. But you don't need it because you're so depleted and exhausted. Oh my gosh, that is exactly it. All the time I'm thinking how particularly younger people don't, they never had that sense of what it feels like to wake up in the morning like that. I mean, I think about when I was little, because this is all very recent, mm-hmm. all of this chemical damage. And I woke up and I felt great. And like, I just wasn't thinking about these things because the food was nutrient dense. Yeah. And, and so it's very, it's very frustrating. And when I went to, so when I found out that I was gluten intolerant, I went to a conference at Columbia that was on gluten intolerance and celiac disease. And I, they were saying, we don't know what it is about the grain that's causing this huge epidemic of gluten intolerance. And so I asked, is anything being sprayed on the grain? Again, I, I was totally new to this whole world of pesticides and they didn't know. And then a scientist from General Mills was there to, to promote his gluten-free Cheerios. And he came over and he found me and he said, yeah, actually Roundup is glyphosate is sprayed on our grains just before harvest. I think that that should be looked into. And so I started looking into it and very little was written about it, but there were a few scientists that were talking about it because it also acts as an antibiotic and it kills off the beneficial gut bacteria in our microbiome and can lead to leaky gut. And then you have the whole cascade of autoimmunity. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is everywhere. Glyphosate, it has to be. And I named myself glyphosate girl because I started 
um, going to the Roundup cancer trials that were happening in San Francisco. And I started an anonymous blog called Glyphosate Girl, where I would talk about all the corrupt things that the EPA was doing and what Monsanto had done and the blow by blow of these court cases. And then I was anonymous at first because I was scared of Monsanto and they like very quickly figured out who I was anyway. And so then I was like, well, I'll keep glyphosate girl around. But that is really why I, I focus on it. So that brings me to ask you then, glyphosate is not legal in some other countries. Europe, I hear a lot. Do you, is that true? So unfortunately, no, it, they do use it. And it just was coming up for um, re-registration. And right after... In 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer concluded that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. Um, so they did that. And then Europe, because they're Europe, were really upset about it. And they were like, we need to ban this when it comes up for re-registration in a few years. And so that was a lot of momentum. Then COVID hit. And then something happened where the companies were able to really persuade the regulators there that it's actually not a carcinogen. And so just this, just a few months ago, they decided to re-register glyphosate for use in farming for another 10 years. Oh, and so no. they do use it. And it's so sad. And it just like the momentum was totally lost by COVID. Oh, that's terrible. Do you know of anywhere in the world that is not? So I hear of people, the reason I ask, like going to Italy and being able to eat gluten and not having the same issue. Um, is that just uh, is it because the the wheat is not genetically modified, or do you do you know if that's even if there's any truth to it? I've heard it more yeah, than once. So, well, so I had this experience where I was in Copenhagen, and um, there was a, the first Joe in the Juice is actually from Copenhagen, and so I went there, and I was like, can I have the gluten free muffin? And so I had it, and it was really good. And I came back the next day, and I said, can I have the gluten free muffin? And they said, we don't have gluten free muffins because they never had. That person had been wrong, but I had been fine. So it was like a blind test. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really something. And um, and so then I started looking into that too. And usually they don't do that pre-harvest spray. They use glyphosate as a weed killer, but they don't do that desiccation um, thing, the drying out that I, I was talking about. And in fact, now Europe has banned the use of it for spraying before harvest. So it's a combination of that. And it's a, com it's a combination of that as well as the long time that they take to process the breads and the, and the glutens. And it makes those proteins that are in bread much less, um, not, I wouldn't say toxic because they're not toxic, but more digestible. Okay. And so that in the US, we really hurry the processing along and we just don't get that really digestible type of bread. Now, one place that is trying to ban glyphosate, and right now there's a huge legal battle about it, is Mexico, because they are trying to ban GMO corn and glyphosate because they don't want it anymore. And the U.S. now is is really threatening them and telling them if they don't take basically our poisons, that they're gonna they're gonna restrict other trade access if we don't keep on if they don't keep on taking it. Oh, so that's very sad. And that's I'm heartbreaking. Just, I don't I don't understand us. Like it makes us seem like a horrible toxic bully. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the schoolyard bully. That's cool. Good job, America. That's great. Yeah, wonderful. Um, do you know if there's any momentum any either way as far as that goes, or it's just up in the air? And when do you when when will there be a verdict on that, or is that something that you know? Well, so it was supposed to be just done, and they were going to go ahead and do. Mexico was going to go ahead and do it anyway, and then uh, the United States and came up with this idea. Okay, well, you show us the science that shows that GMOs are actually unhealthy. And so they they did that and they have this huge, huge document of all the research that shows how unhealthy these GMOs are. And they're like, show us where it's safe. That's what Mexico said to the United States. And they're like, oh, you're just making that up. They're like, there's nothing made up about all of these this toxicity. So now it's being sent to a panel that's been selected, supposedly a neutral panel to look at the science. And in history, whenever there's a neutral panel, they are absolutely not neutral at all. And it always comes out in favor of the agricultural chemical. Um, so my hope is they have a new president in, in Mexico and she's like totally on board with this. And I just hope they keep on pushing along anyway. Yeah, I would hope so. So as you continue your personal journey with glyphosates and figuring this out, um, when you started limiting glyphosates or or how did that next step go once you became okay maybe it's not so much the gluten do you eat um like organic wheat are you able to tolerate that is it was it the gluten or was it the glyphosates or was it a combination 
So it's a combination. It's a combination of the glyphosate um, impacting, and for those who know about leaky gut, it can also make the regulation of the of the gut barrier um, malfunction. And, and both gluten can do that as can glyphosate. So the combination is like a double whammy. And I think that my body at this point is just saying no to gluten in general in this country. And so I stay away from it. Um, I have tried organic American organic gluten products and I can't tolerate them. So I don't know. I, I don't, I don't even know what, but I don't even bother eating them anymore, but I do eat mostly organically, but this is where it gets hard because as I'm sure everyone knows, it's really impossible to stay like hundred percent organic because unless you are going to restaurants or not going to have a social life, um, unless you're going to organic restaurants or not going to have a social life, it's very, very hard to stay away from all these things. So, um, so I try and do 70% organic in my day and leave 30% for not so that I can have a social life and not seem too strange when I go out. <laughs> Cause you know, I, you know, people think it's really weird and I wish that they didn't. And I have friends right now that are trying to get pregnant actually. And, and it breaks my heart because I know if they ate organically, their likelihood of conceiving would be so much better. Um, but it's like, I think they think like I'm being funny, even when I present the research, it's like, it's hard to believe that I think our government would allow us to be consuming this or something like there's this big mental mind gap that they just can't get there mentally, or think it's some kind of conspiracy theory, which is also weird, because it's very, very factual with this. I mean, it's all there. Right. I, I agree with you. I've had conversations with people about nutrition in general or deficiencies or glyphosates or potentially this, you know, when I, I hear things like, oh, I'm struggling with this illness or I can't sleep at night or this, you know, I usually try to have a comprehensive conversation and approach. Granted, they're open to it. But I find a lot of times that when you get into giving even subtle advice about nutrition, it's almost the reaction you get a lot of times is like you're giving someone diet advice, like how to lose weight when they don't want to take that. It's almost like they they think of it like a little bit like, oh, so you're going to tell me what, you know, what I should and shouldn't eat. I like to eat like this, you know, and that's the sad part is that it's not even about what you're eating. It's about knowing what's on and in what you're eating. And it's so frustrating sometimes to feel like this is such um, it's such a taboo subject or so, s such uncommon knowledge that people have a really hard time wrapping their minds around that this is this is what's happening. And I, I, I liken it to this and I, I kind of get a lot of eyeballs to open up and ears to perk up when I say this. I say, so tell me this, would you give a glass of milk? to your daughter, granddaughter, child, whatever, if you knew that it had a, just one little tiny drop of antifreeze in it or anything that belongs in an engine, gasoline, if it had like a drop of gasoline, you name it, would you, what would you do with that gallon of milk if you knew that there was one drop of something that's really toxic in there? And like I would That's throw a it. really good way to put it. Yeah, I would throw it away. And I'm like, okay, but okay, so great. We're on the same page. Like if you knew for sure, like if you saw somebody go and put something toxic in something you were about to feed your family and it was undeniable, you saw it with your own eyes, you knew that it happened, would you feed it to your family still? Like, No, I would throw it away. I'm like, okay, so I just want you to understand that is what's happening to our food and it's not your fault. I'm not coming down on you. This is not your fault. You should be upset too because basically we're being misinformed. And I, you know, it might be a stretch to say lied to, but it certainly feels like there is so much uh, covering up and not really wanting to have these things be well, be well known. And, um, you know, we could go on and on for the reasons for that. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, our sick care system. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, people not realizing the toll that it's taken on them until they have to go to the doctor because they have these health issues. And then when they're told about the health issues, it's not like, let's find their root cause. Let's test deficiency. I'm actually surprised that you even got your, your, your vitamin and mineral levels tested because it's not the first thing doctors go to by a long shot if they visit that at all. 
So I was was floored. I was floored. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, and once again, I think that this was just someone who had given the instructions to this young psychiatrist of what an intake blood test should look like must have added it because there was like the folate, the MTHFR kind of stuff on it. And, but he didn't really even know how to interpret that. So it must've been some sort of form thing. Do you have that? The MTHFR genetic mutation? Yeah, I'm like homozygous. What does that one mean? I don't know. That means that I had like a double copy of it, which is bad. Oh, like the worst version. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, I think 40% of people have that, but don't know. And that has to do with B vitamins, not the natural B vitamins. So folate, for example, is a natural B vitamin, correct? You can have folate, right? Yes. Okay. But folic acid is the synthetic version. It was made in a lab. It didn't even exist a hundred years ago. And for whatever reason... Um, it is incorporated into all of our wheat products, cereals. If you look at a cereal box, it's going to have folic acid. If you look at prenatal vitamins, unless you do your homework, most of them are going to have folic acid in them, which is not good if you can't methylate it. Basically, if you can't break it down and digest it, it is a toxin in the body. Um, and it's, and it's uh, you know, I think that it's potentially linked to all kinds of issues. Oh, yeah. ADD, ADHD in children, when they don't, your body doesn't know what to do with that. Um, postpartum depression. These are all things that have come up in conversations with people that are much smarter than me that understand the potential for the risk it has to even have um, this synthetic B vitamins, much less fruit and food that is genetically modified. That's a bit confusing to our body. This is what I believe anyways. I believe that that's very confusing to our body because our bodies were made to digest the food that was naturally formed on this earth. And we don't, we don't even understand the full depth of what it does to genetically modify something and to put it into our body. But when you see something like this with a genetic, you know, they call it a genetic mutation, but is it a, is it like a, a downfall or is it a protection mechanism? <laughs> you know, And even if you can methylate it, even if you can break out these synthetic B vitamins, should you have to? Exactly. Right. There's a, there's no way that we should be doing this. And I, I'm so mad because I didn't have this information when, during, when I was pregnant. And so I was having folic acid, mm-hmm. not realizing, thinking, okay, well, you know, this isn't my prenatal or whatever. And, and so that's just what you do. And I'm so with you in terms of the genetically modified stuff, because what we have coming is actually even scarier than this herbicide tolerant um, GMOs that we know about that are the corn and the soy that were developed to be resistant. Actually, now it's not just resistant to Roundup, but it's also dicamba and 2,4-D, which is part of Agent Orange, because the plants are getting smart and they're becoming resistant um, or they're they're outthinking. The weeds that Roundup is supposed to kill in these GMO fields, they're outthinking. They're evolving. They're evolving. So now it no longer works on them. And I love that, but I don't think humans can do that. And and so I think it still works on us. Um, and I also, but so this GMO 2.0 situation. Well, well we out. can, we, we can evolve potentially to not be able to have children because our bodies will recognize that, hey, this is toxic. We oh, maybe yeah, shouldn't procreate point. in this environment. Yeah, that that is how we're evolving. Actually, nature is saying no more human species, right? Yeah, that's scary. So the GMOs that are coming out are CRISPR edited and they take, um, they say that people that are making these, the scientists, they're saying that this is no different than general hybridization. And so you have a lot of hybrid fruits, veggies, wheat, all these things that over time scientists will try and get the best varieties by combining different varieties. And it takes time to do this. Well, so these gene editing uh, the companies have arisen and they said, well, that's great. Let's accelerate this hybridization. And we're going to use CRISPR technology to genetically modify the DNA structure. And these are brand new things. So now they have lettuce, they have potatoes coming, all these things that we don't need, but there's no money in just growing them regularly. And so they're saying to feed the world, we're going to need this genetic modification. And so there are mustard greens that are come out, coming out by the pharmaceutical company Bayer that bought Monsanto. And those will be hitting grocery stores this fall. And what is so terrifying about that is like our bodies, there's a reason sometimes why hybridization doesn't work because it's not taking in nature. If you go in and you are using CRISPR technology to create organisms that shouldn't ever happen in nature, and then expect that our bodies are going to recognize them as healthy food. It's crazy. 
And I think you're going to see a huge explosion in food allergies now to new things like lettuces and different things that we were never meant to have an allergic response to. So I'm really worried about that. And I'm mad at Whole Foods right now because I think that what they're doing is they're paving the way for this new type of genetically modified crop because they used to be pretty committed to not carrying much that was genetically modified. And suddenly they have impossible meats. They have GMO corn. You, you go into Whole Foods, most Whole Foods around the country right now, you cannot buy a sweet corn that's not genetically modified. So people are here for the summer having their corn on the cob, excited for it, and it's genetically modified, which is ridiculous. And so I have my eye closely on them because I think they're going to be launching this GMO 2.0. And it's horrible because a lot of times it's not even labeled. Oh, what about, what do you think about the appeal? So I, have any opinions I, don't, on that? I don't like appeal at all. And, and I had a little tiff with Mark Hyman about it actually, because um, one of his podcasts was sponsored by appeal and he was a big backer of appeal. And I, my feeling about it is that when I buy an avocado at Whole Foods, which I don't anymore, that's been treated with appeal, it's fully rotten inside because the peel stayed healthy and it looked right. But then inside it actually was rotting from within. And I've had several people reach out to me and tell me that they're having allergic reactions to appeal, like they're getting um, mouth swelling from it. And it's not labeled on organic produce. So you don't know when you're buying Now you do know that at Trader Joe's and Costco and, and sprouts, sprouts, they are not using it. But I don't, I don't like that Whole Foods is doing it and not, and not labeling it. Because what if you don't understand why you're having some kind of reaction to something? You think, oh, great, I'm spending up for the organic avocado, apple, whatever. I don't know why I'm having this reaction. Yeah. So. so if you had to pick, let's say you were going into a grocery store and you had to choose between organic or genetically modified um, or non-GMO, I should say, which one are you going? Do you prioritize those labels yes. at all? So I'm always first organic. Okay. Um, second, I will look for a lot of the gluten-free foods actually are not organic, which is too bad because if you're gluten-free, you've already had so many insults that got you to be gluten-free in the first place. And But anyway, a lot of it's not organic. And so then I'll look to see if there's a non-GMO project label on it. And that would mean that at least it doesn't have GMOs, but it doesn't mean that it hasn't been sprayed with all kinds of pesticides. A new thing that I'm looking for is whether it is uh, something called Regenified, um, that is a new label that is coming out. It, it actually is out. It's now on Vital Farms. Um, something from um, King Arthur's Bakery is coming out that is regenified. And this is a huge thing because I would like the whole world to be organic, ideally. But it's not happening because of the economic barriers and also the societal barriers for farmers to change their farming practices. Yeah, well, it's food used to just be people. food. We didn't have to call it organic or not organic. It was just grown the way that it was meant to be with all of these chemicals sprayed on them. And now we actually have to define, which I had just had a, a conversation with a family member of mine, too, is like, you know, I've never bought organic because I just felt like it was a label. Like, what is organic? Like everything when I grew up, you know, was organic and it was, she came from a farm. And it's like, so she didn't even quite understand um, why you would need to label something organic, even what's going on and uh, what organic actually means and what non or more importantly, what non-organic means. I think organic is pretty um, self-explanatory, it's just kind of left to its own, well, or it should be hopefully with the appeal thing that might be a whole other conversation but more importantly what does conventional mean what does non-organic mean what is it what are we putting in our bodies at that point yeah the the conventional it's so funny that conventional now means has chemicals or grown with chemicals mm -hmm. that that's so standard that it's conventional um so that means and you know not necessarily if something's conventional it doesn't mean that it's the worst thing ever but you don't have a guarantee that it isn't Mm -hmm. So it's really taking more of a risk. Um, and if something says that it's GMO or now they call it bioengineered because the industry went into government and they said, you can't call it GMO because so many people feel bad about GMOs and it's, they won't buy our products. So let's call it bioengineered instead, instead. And so when you see something's bioengineered, that means it's a GMO product. And that's what you'll see right now in Whole Foods on the sweet corn is bio, a bioengineered product. And that's really not going to be good because not only are are the cells themselves 
genetically modified that are within the corn, but then also it's likely been sprayed with up to six different herbicides at this point. Um, and that they, the other thing is that these same corn, a lot of the corn and the soy have been genetically modified with a BT toxin, which is supposed to be toxic, like to well, actually with corn in this case, to um, a special kind of pesticide that, or a, a insecticide Sorry, let me start that over. Okay. So the corn is supposed to be uh, resistant to certain types of insects. The BT corn is supposed to be. And those insects now have also evolved to not be impacted by that BT toxin. And so now farmers are having to spray more toxic insecticides also on these GMO, the GMO corn to try and kill the bugs that the GMO corn was supposed to kill just by virtue of being bred to not be interesting to those insects. So when you're going in there and you're going to buy something bioengineered, any of those chemicals could be on this thing. Is it those herbicides or insecticides? Um, I feel like I use those terms kind of interchangeable, but I'm sure that they have their own exact meanings. So I think insecticide is the right word. Um, are they, do you know, more designed to kill the insects or to just deter them from eating, like make them not want this plant anymore? They are for killing. And it's an enormous problem because once, and I was no, I mean, I've, I've always studied, I came from business and I've always been more into economics actually. But when you start to really look at the science of the ecosystems, it's fascinating because of course, logically, if we think about this, if you kill a couple of pests that are the ones that are responsible for decreasing yields on the farm, if you kill a couple, well, then it also kills all the pests. And then even the beneficial pests, they're supposed to kill the ones that are predatory, um, die also. And so now you see on these farms that use insecticides, they're having to use more and more and more insecticides because all these natural predators are now killed. And so it's called getting on the chemical treadmill where they just have to keep on adding things and adding things because of the insults from the pesticide they used before. Well, and I so think it's really about the, an expensive problem. I think about the bees too, right? That's a huge problem for our honeybees. Um, oh, it's so sad. And, you know, the neonics are, so never in history have insecticides been as toxic as they are right now in, in the United States. And they're so toxic to bees. And actually just, I think just today or just this week, Vermont banned the use, uh, use of neonics, which is the worst possible pesticide or insecticide for bees. And that's following on New York that also did that, um, I think a few years ago. So those are two states that are moving in the right direction. I'd like to see California do it. I think they're pretty dependent on it right now, which is too bad. But that is very exciting because those are horrible. Yeah. Well, at least there's some enlightening news, good news that we can bring to the table. Two states. Woohoo. Let's yeah. get the rest in order. Uh, what about the other 48? Um, okay. So I was going to ask you um, your advice when you are reading food labels and or the most Thing, like the most toxic things that you look out for. You know, this is a, your personal advice. It's not medical advice. I have probably my own system that I will go with that I may elaborate on as well. You know, I typically try to go with Whole Foods, um, not Whole Foods, the store, but whole literally not messed with because even if you're getting something organic, gluten-free, this, that, if it's, if it's a processed food, it's still not great for you. Um, no matter which way you slice it, in my opinion, uh, I'm a human. I like to eat things. I like to eat food that I know is not always great for me. So I understand. I empathize with everybody who does, but I'm saying generally speaking, this is a great way to avoid most of those things. If you're just eating the potato and the steak and the, you know, and or asparagus or fruit or whatever it is, that's generally good because it's one, it should be one ingredient, which is what we're striving for. But I know that you have a little bit of a system and I'm also really curious about the most toxic. Like if you had like a top five list or I don't know if you have a top three or a top 10 or whatever it is, it's like these, if you can't get it organic, really steer clear of those. Yes, for sure. Number one, steer clear of anything that is not organic, that is made with chickpeas. So that means hummus. And recently, actually just a couple of weeks ago, I'm on the board of this group called Moms Across America. We tested Banza pasta, which is the gluten-free chickpea based pasta. And it was well over 2000 parts per billion of glyphosate in it, which is so high that a lot of people are saying, well, no wonder why I have such an upset stomach after I have it. And that is because of this pre-harvest desiccation that they do on chickpeas. 
So that if you can't get any a chickpea item organically, don't have it. Does that go this- for does that go for the impossible burger as well? Have people tested the glyphosates in that or whatever the the you know yeah. uh, plant based are those really high in glyphosates as well? Maybe I'm jumping the gun here. No, so impossible is not good for glyphosate. It was tested. It wasn't as high as that. But what's problematic in impossible is actually the GMO coloring that they develop so that it bleeds like right. meat would. And so that's a pretty toxic um, soy-based okay. derived um, GMOs. And, and it's so funny that they say that this is going to save the world and help help the planet so much because any of this chemical farming is not doing any good for the planet or human health. No. So yeah. I, I would never eat that. I think it's just disgusting. That's probably my number two thing that I would never eat after the hummus. Uh, the number three in this is probably surprising is I actually would rather not eat berries and I would rather take a multivitamin than eat a non-organic berry because they have so many toxic fungicides and insecticides and some herbicides as well sprayed on it regularly. So particularly strawberries, blueberries aren't great. Raspberries are not good. So I stay away from those and would rather have a synthetic version or just wait until I have the organic version. Okay. And then does organic mean that it's not sprayed with anything at all or what is the language there do you do you know what that actually means if it's organic like what are we guaranteed and what are we a little gray on you are they definitely use organic pesticides in a lot of organic farming and so they are not synthetically derived but of course we know some natural things can be damaging too but in general they're going to be much less toxic than the synthetic herbicides so or, or pesticides in general And one of the things that they do also, which is something to take note of, and it's something I'm looking into right now that most people don't know. So organic farming systems can't use synthetic fertilizer. And so instead they use manure, which they usually get from the confined animal factory systems where the cows have been eating the GMOs full of all these toxins. And then they, their excretion, you know, like that's the way they get rid of the pesticides then is brought over to the organic farm and used as fertilizer. And then those chemicals end up in the soil of the organic farming. And so organic has a long way to go because it's still an input-based model, meaning they're having to buy all these pesticides. Their organic ones are usually more expensive and the fertilizer to make it all happen. So it's not like it's a perfect system. Really the ideal system in their very, very few farms that are like this is regenerative organic because it's pro-ecosystem and less inputs. Oh, this is so eye opening. I just feel like um, it, I feel like a bit of a gut punch. I'm not going to lie because you would, th- you know, I I genuinely was under the impression for quite some time that organic men, it's just not not nothing like it's not messed with at all. It's completely grown the way that it was supposed to be. And it's just tough to hear that even when you spend more money, you you take the time to make more effort that you're not getting what you think you're getting. And we're so busy. People are busy. We don't all have time to have nutrition degrees and really look into what is going on with our food system. Like people, wa- people in America want to be able to trust that our food is generally not harming us. It's that, that it's generally healthy. And this is so maddening and how much more expensive it is too to eat organically. Oh, totally infuriating. It's so unfair. And one interesting anecdote, I ran into a farmer at a conference who had been hired by Putin actually in Russia to manage his family farm because Putin's really in, apparently, I mean, I'm not a Putin fan, but apparently he's really into clean eating. And Monsanto came back around then and said, look, we have these GMOs, we have these pesticides, you should start using those. And he said, get out of our country. We are never going to buy this. You're going to make the whole population sick. And so they are very, very into small family farms that don't use pesticides um, in Russia. And I think if you look long-term, which country and which system is going to succeed, I think you should look at the food source because they're all going to be healthy while we're all dying of all these chronic diseases. Did you know that more than 90% of American adults are deficient in at least one mineral? But why does that matter? Well, minerals play an important role in regulating your metabolism, sleep, brain function, and so much more. So if you struggle with fatigue or brain fog, if you wake up exhausted and have trouble falling asleep at night, you might benefit from adding some minerals back into your diet. 
Beam Minerals offers a liquid mineral supplement that gives you every essential mineral your body needs in the right ratios. All you do is take a shot of liquid every morning. It tastes like water and replenishes your mineral stores in 30 seconds a day. If you want better sleep and more energy, go to beamminerals.com and use code MISHA at checkout for 20% off. Yeah, I, I'm i with you. I, I, I heard that Russia made it illegal for genetically modified foods um, and that uh, they're actually if subsidizing is the right word, but helping um, incentivize organic farming. It's yeah, that's what they're doing because they know nothing could be more important than giving people the sustenance they need. And you were talking earlier in the beginning of this podcast about our kids, and this is the absolute hardest thing. And I, it makes me so sad. Like I, I see my kids go off to school and sometimes they'll get lunch there or because they're tired of just what, I provide the same freaking like organic things that are not very interesting. And, and I feel so upset and I I'm sitting there with like, you know, vitamins when they come home and trying to protect them from all these toxins. And, you know, when my daughter was full on tween mode, we had a fight in the, in the aisle at target because she just, she's like, she wanted to buy this candy for her friend. I said, I don't want to be providing that candy for your friend. She's like, you can't impart our ways on everyone else. <laughs> Oh, I, like, know. I know. I struggle. I can't stand it. I, I, stand it. Like, I, I don't want to give them that junk. I know. I know the struggle. I just had my son and my daughter's birthday not too long ago, and I used organic ingredients to make the cupcakes because I thought I can't, I don't feel right about feeding all these kids what I know is toxic. I, and I, I want to try to get more of my friends and family on board with this too. That's like when we have a gathering, um, I know it's a little bit more of an ask, but I really believe we either pay the farmer today or we pay the pharmacist tomorrow. I live and I die by that. And I want to be able to go and have everybody on the same page that, hey, yeah, it's going to cost a little more, but we vote with our dollars. And if we can give our dollars to these small farmers, eventually they'll be able to bring the cost down because they'll be able to produce more and they'll be able to not struggle to do the right thing. But if we just give in to the system, if we don't fight back, if we don't take back our food sovereignty, then... I feel like this country is set on a really bad trajectory. And I I question whether I want to be a part of it sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, where can I move? And then it comes back to be like, no, Misha, you are a fighter and you have to fight. Because if everybody just leaves because it's easier that way, then America is, I hate to use the word doomed, but I feel like that. You know, when I go to Target with my daughter too, and she's like, I want pirate booties, mommy. And it's so hard when we go down every aisle and like 90% of it is terrible. You cannot even walk into a gas station anywhere to my knowledge and buy a single organic thing, much less anything Um, genetically not genetically modified or if you if you want something that's quote-unquote a whole food and healthy I could think of about three things that could at least meet that uh, uh, requirement Um, and it would be hard-boiled eggs and or the fruit uh, that might sit at the front that's you know wrapped in cellophane Um, I mean that's it I walk into gas stations I'm like there is nothing I can have in here Nothing. nothing. That- I have walked even the bigger marts like have nothing. One time I saw a Justin's organic like peanut butter cup, but I have to say I've had so many of those because a lot of times it's the only choice that I'm like, a little <laughs> over it. But oh my gosh, it's just crazy not to have any choices at all. What is going on? Yeah, I think we're it's just a sign of how many people are uninformed and really don't know. And I don't want this podcast to be a a downer of like, oh my gosh, this is so depressing. Yes, it is depressing. It is right now, but that doesn't mean that it can't be fixed because we're talking about it before it's completely done. You know, I just took my kids to see a farm, to see a ranch, excuse me, um, where cattle are grown and raised the way that it was meant to be. They free range, they eat grass, the, the, um, rancher it's lazy j meats he also uh butchers not butchers but he processes the meat excuse me um and he 
showed my children what it should look like to have a regenerative farm where they grow their own non-pesticide, chemical-free hay that they feed to their cows. And it was such a beautiful restoring process, but I feel like this is a dying thing and we have to fight back. I am sick of sitting back and just seeing everybody um, not realize that they have more of a choice and not even know that there is a choice that needs to be made. And we have to. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so well said. You're such a fighter. I, I wish. We well, could so are you. I mean, you're... I wish we could duplicate many of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just need hey, numbers. I just feel like it's, and it's so frustrating, but I'm not going to give up the good fight. I'm not going to run from my country because I think America is beautiful and ultimately what we stand for. And, you know, the, the progress we make in so many great ways that it's worth fighting for, but, um, I can't stand alone in this. You can't stand alone in this. We have strength in numbers. You know, if you think of an an, an ant farm or or bee, you know, it's not the single bee, but it's the the power in numbers. So, I'm just I really want to encourage people to just think twice. Just take a second. Please pause for a second and realize that there is a metaphorical drop of antifreeze in your loaf of bread, in your milk, in your beef. And it's it's not even as nutritionally um dense. You're not getting as much out of it too. I was talking with, uh, with, with Brendan and he was telling me, you know, that there is not nearly as much nutrition in the meat. I think if I'm remember this, right. Um, that Braden was saying that there was a third of the nutritional value in a pound of conventionally raised beef as there is. And one that is raised as the way he does it. So you're, you're not getting the nutrients and we have to understand this is how our brains form. This is how we, we regenerate through fuel and nutrition. Food is not just something that's pleasure on your tongue. It's not meant to be as simple as that. It is actually meant to go into your body and replenish and restore. But if you are having arthritis, if you're having migraines, if you're having bloating, if you're having digestive issues, if you're having all these complications, if, I mean, the list goes on, there is a strong potential, a really strong potential that you're either ingesting too many toxins and, or you're not getting the nutritional value out of these foods that are raised in a way that doesn't, that makes them look great. They have dyes added to them or a waxy coating or whatever it is that's going to make it look so beautiful. And then it's going to maybe taste good because it's, it's modified in a way that hijacks our brain and that the system that was designed to tell us what food to eat. Um, there's so much that goes into that, that I think that people just need to know that they actually have a choice to make and they're making a choice every single time that you go to a grocery store and you agree to, um, to, to vote with your dollars in, in a way, um, that's just not the direction that we, I feel like we need to go. No. And I would like people also to know that with a lot of these chronic diseases, not all, but with a lot of them, you can reverse disease. Yeah. And you don't have to be on drugs your entire life. Yeah. And your child is struggling with an autoimmune condition or migraines or IBS. Just this, there are a lot of ADHD, anxiety, depression. A lot of these things can be really helped by assessing what food you're eating. And it's hard to believe because people have spent, and probably a lot of your listeners spend money and they go to doctors who are preeminent. And the doctors I saw were at Stanford. They're outstanding, highly achieved physicians who know nothing about this don't know anything about the food toxicity, don't think it's important. It is important. And it, in a lot of cases, it's why we are sick. So don't feel like your child necessarily has to stay on Adderall if they are going to be able to pass through school. Because I found with my own son who had really bad ADHD, I made him gluten-free and organic. And lo and behold, he was a new boy in three months and has not struggled with that since. My daughter had digestive problems that were really bad and really just painful. She went gluten-free and organic, and now she clearly, given the target argument, now she's about the same percentage I am, where she's 30% non and 70% organic. And we still have ongoing fights about it. It's not easy, but she is doing great. She's thriving. She's an athlete. So I just realized you are not predestined to be sick like this. And you don't necessarily need medications to be treating it either. You can just get to the root cause, solve it and move forward with healthy eating and start building back up the nutrients in your body that they, that they need. 
Yeah. It's like, well, what do you think we're made of? <laughs> we're, totally. we're, we're a living body of nutrients. So when we don't put those things in and when we put ultra processed foods that are very low um, in those nutrients, we we cause all kinds of issues. And it, it just it's it's actually the easiest thing to understand if you just think about it in the most simple terms. You know, it's what we what we are, what we eat. And it gets a little more complicated as far as moving into why um, these foods are addicting and why they can make us sick. But that's why we're having this conversation, hopefully to simplify some of the big things. And I think that I um, took you off topic of the other uh, few things that you should try to avoid. We went to chickpeas. And is there anything else that people should try to berries. avoid? Berries. Okay, Any if they're not organic. The that's right. Any of the grains that are non-organic are going to likely be sprayed pre-harvest, either with glyphosate or that other 2,4-D that I was mentioning, or uh, actually a number of other different chemicals that can be used to dry it out. That will be true in grains. That's true in sugar, in the beans. Um, orange juice is something I don't drink unless it is organic because a lot of glyphosate is sprayed around the orchard and then it's picked up through the roots and goes into the fruit. So you'll see that also in almond orchards. That's a big area where the, the actual systemic content of pesticides can be very high and the fungicides can also be very high in these orchards. So I'm careful with those things. Some things that I might eat um, that are not organic, <laughs> I'm trying to even think. I wouldn't even recommend anything, but let's just say uh, I, things with appeal usually are with not appeal, but a peel. Okay. Are you <laughs> like a banana? Like a banana are usually going to be at least free of the topical types of pesticides. Maybe not the systemic, but the topical kind. So that is going to be better. I um, typically will, you know, my meats that I pick aren't always organic, but I feel good if they're at least um, partially grass fed. And sometimes I'm the annoying person at a restaurant that asks exactly where they source them from. So that's another thing. And, or, and there are times also that I will be at a restaurant and I have to pick between a salad and like a steak. And I really want that salad, but I don't get it because of just the accumulation of all the different pesticides that are on that salad. Lettuces tend to be very, very sprayed um, with pesticides. So a lot of times I'll take the steak instead because I think that's going to be a smaller amount of pesticides than the salad. Do you feel it now since you've been living this healthy lifestyle? Does your body actually give you a reaction when you consume something that is, um, you probably don't, but I'm sure have crossed the way you have or before you knew. Did, I mean, does your body give you any kind of reaction to these things? Oh my gosh, so much so. But it, it, it keeps, so I can cheat on it somewhat but for example when you know when you're traveling it's really hard to find organic food and so sometimes i have to find like a whole foods there to just pick up some things for myself but when i'm eating at a restaurant say for 7 days at the end of that i feel like i need to be extra careful with what i'm eating just to recover from the damage because i'll start getting a super bloated stomach and i can tell that my brain is getting foggy and i just don't feel good and sometimes i get this one red rash that just shows up right here and huge and it's itchy and I know that that's when my body is really struggling with inflammation. So I don't know. Do you, does your body give you signs? Yeah, for sure. Um, I have not gone gluten-free. I still love bread so much, but I've gone organic. And a lot of times I make it at home, which is in a task in itself. But uh, also, are you familiar with the brand One Mighty Mill? No, what is that? Okay, so they are milling wheat the way that it was intended to be, like back in the day. So they actually take it and go through the process slowly, and they make the bread. And it's in Costco now. Um, and I've been following them because I'm like, look, this is really nice. And it's organic. There's no preservatives in it and no seed oils at either. So it is really a great product. Now, the shelf life is shortened because that's the way that it was supposed to be. So you generally want to freeze it or use it within a week and you want to keep it refrigerated. But I will take that all day long over um, the things that are um, not uh, processed that way or have the added preservatives. So yeah, entirely preservative free, entirely natural, and they, they mill the wheat the old fashioned way. So it's a really fantastic brand that if you are like me, where you feel like you can tolerate wheat and gluten, I think I do all right with wheat and gluten. I'm not super sensitive. I don't have a celiac disease. Um, but 
I try to go that route more often and or bake it myself. And now a lot of people are probably going to say, I don't have time. I'm busy. I I get it. I understand. Um, maybe try to make it your hobby thing that you do. If, if it's important to you, um, make it the project that you do with your kids. Uh, this is something that I do where, you know, I don't, I try to combined it with things that um, help me make the best use of my time. So I'll bring my kids in and, I, and like, hey, we're going to make bread together. We're going to make pretzels together. We're going to do this. We're going to roll it. We're going to. And then I'm accomplishing a family activity while also feeding my family in a, ba- a way that I feel like is more helpful and nutritious. So those are some things that I try to do. And then I, when I'm reading food labels, and I know I've heard you say this before, but really just try to get the least ingredients possible. And try to steer away from anything that you can't pronounce like if oh you know um what is the one that my my um my aunt's always talking about she's a gastrointestinal uh a gastrologist i guess is the right word for it and um she's like don't ever eat that because it destroys your gut lining and gives you gut um maltodextrin it's multo. Oh, is that right? Maltodextrin. Yeah, I think it's maltodextrin. I've seen that. Maltodextrose. I'm not sure. It gets complicated to say these things, but yeah, she's like, "Don't ever eat that." And it was like, it's in. Um, I know that it's in a lot of chips and it's in a lot of things, but she is adamant about avoiding that. And she's not totally on the uh, organic, but she's seen it firsthand. What happens to people's guts? when they eat that stuff. Now I'm sure it's probably not just that, but she's very, she's vehement about it. And, um, so I've like, well, I'll take you, I'll, I'll steer clear. I already steer clear most of that stuff anyways, you know? So, um, but it's hard because you want to balance the life and especially with kids. Um, you know, my, my daughter, sometimes, you know, she asked me, well, why do they get to eat that? Why do, you know, why do they get to have McDonald's? And I, I try to have the conversation with her as a six year old, or at the time she was asking me a five and I say, you know, it's because I want to protect you as much as I can and I love you. And that fast food, I won't name any specific chains, but I say, honey, that stuff is more closer to garbage than it is food. But there are a lot of scientists out there that have developed this to make it taste really, really, really good. But it's not good for us. It's it's basically lies. And so um, it's a tough thing to navigate. It's hard. And I, I apologize for my kids. I'm like, I don't like being like this in case there's confusion that like, they think that I enjoy being really strict <laughs> with them. I, I'm not, I, I really am mad. And that's why I do what I do because I don't want to have to have these fights with you guys all the time about this. Yeah. I just want you to go eat. Yeah. What, I guess, um, one thing I did want to ask you too, is when you cleared yourself primarily of these things, what are some of the side effects that you saw reversed? Um, what, what, what were some of the big ticket things? Oh my gosh. So first of all, my energy started to return, which was amazing. I got feeling back in my fingers that had been gone. My fingers and toes like just were constantly tingling to the point that I was pretty sure I must have MS, but then I didn't. Uh, so that was a really big one. Anxiety really came way down. I was able to sleep through the night. My hair started growing back. Um, I had way less rashes because I, I now get that one on my face, but I used to get them all over the place. So that got a lot better. Do you know what kind of rash that is? Like, is it a rosé, is it like rosacea or eczema or was there any diagnosis on that? Just so people could say like, oh, I might have that too. Well, I think, I think it's rosacea ish, but they didn't call it that, but that, given what I know about rosacea, I think that's effectively what it was. Um, and, uh, let's see. Yeah. The. Another, let's see what else. Um, I had autoimmune numbers that came down, which came back down to normal, which was fantastic. Um, so there just there were a lot of things. I was fine. The sleeping through the night was a really huge one, actually. I just remember that first night that I was able to sleep. I'm like, oh my gosh, thank God, because it'd been so long. And then I was able to taper, as I mentioned earlier, when they thought it was psychological and I was so desperate. I was on these two different antidepressants and then Valium and then a steroid and then gabapentin and on all these drugs that totally mess with you and was able to very, very carefully and slowly taper off those over several years, because that is actually really hard to do. I learned because your body becomes dependent on it when it doesn't have the tools to replace whatever that drug is doing. Yeah. That's kind of like living on a credit card system. Some of those, the antidepressants, the way I kind of look at it, it's like borrowing from the future. Uh, yes. happiness. And then eventually you get depleted to the point where it's actually much harder than where you started to, to get back totally. to, to normal. 
Totally. And I, and I'm not even necessarily anti antidepressant because I've seen it really work miracles. I just don't think people should be on them long-term without addressing other parts because it, it also, from what I gather, can wear off. Well, it's kind of the adaption of the body. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I would say that my opinion on, on antidepressants, and this will probably be controversial, is that, um, I am not pro uh, antidepressant unless you are at such a like a, I'm talking like a very severe low where you're not functional to get um, even like motivated to start making change. Right. So if you are to that point, then I would say I think if it were my family, I would say try it. But if it's working for you, then be quickly looking for the solutions. Now that you have the mental fortitude and you have the energy and you have the uplifting feeling, you've got to immediately be seeking how you get off of it. Totally. Yeah. And that's my, that's my opinion on that because I do think that, um, eventually you burn out the system of how those even work because you can't live off credit cards forever. Um, yeah. and eventually I think that can, yeah, that can be detrimental in its own right. So, um, this has been such a good conversation. I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount and I know that my listeners are going to be grateful for the insight that you have provided today. And thank you so much for dedicating your time to this worthy cause, because I'm sure like anyone, you're a busy mother who has a life outside of this otherwise, but you care and you're passionate and you're here um, donating your time. And I'm so thankful. And I know how difficult it can be because I'm on the same page with you as far as the conversations with others and your children. And it's not that you want to be that way. You just want it to be right, right? It doesn't yeah. feel good to know you're doing the wrong thing. It's just too, it's too miserable to live with that feeling, you know? Yeah. So, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on. And it was great to talk to you. It's always so fun to meet like-minded people. It's the best because, you know, it can be pretty lonely, right? Yes. So yes. I'm trying to rally the troops. So consider yourself one of them. Um, and I'm a awesome. troop for you as well. So when you're going to bat, you know, let me know if there's anything that I can do to support, even if it's just using my social media platform or whatever it is. Um, and, and my network of people who are thinking like-mindedly. And um, there's a lot of people that are waking up to this. That's the good news. There are a lot of people who are coming around and asking the questions and starting to find some answers. And um, if I could close in, in, you know, another piece of advice, like really just try to support your local farmer and your local farmer's market, because that's, those are the people that are not going to make the money. They're not, they're not motivated by the money. They're trying to do the right thing. And they're taking time out of their day to be there to do the right thing. Um, and I believe that is the large majority of people who are small farmers and who are at those farmers markets and your dollars matter to them. You know, they're not going to buy some billionaire, another Ferrari, those dollars that you spend at the farmers market is going to, um, buy a new bicycle. It's going to keep the lights on somebody's home. It's going to make the difference. And that's what you can do. And you know, what is also great about that it feels really good feels really good to know that you are you are changing someone's life not only selfishly for your own benefit and your loved one's benefit but you can actually go home and feel good about what you just provided for another family right totally i think that all the time when i go to my farmers market that what you've also given them it's so mutually beneficial it is. So no, it's been fantastic, Kelly. Thank you so much for all your information. Um, I definitely want to stay in touch. Oh, and you're, you have a website that people can go to. Yes, please check it out because what I've done is put together a website called what's, uh, I put together a website called glyphosatefacts.com and you can go there and you can see all of this research that I've collected that is peer reviewed, independent research you can go and read it so that when people are questioning your claims about whether it's an endocrine disruption issue or if it's a carcinogen or if it has all actually liver disease, kidney disease, it's just connected to all kinds of things. You can go there, find the published research and present it to whoever is interested, or you could just learn about how we got here as well. So please check that out if you have questions. It's obviously not funded by any company, so it's very honest. That's great. And the research is there. Now it's time for your common sense to be there as well. Thank you, yes, Kelly. Exactly. Thank you.